It's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink. And listen. Every single passenger on this train is going to die. I can see the future. Well, kind of. That is to say, I can only see the future if it involves me being killed in a spectacularly excruciating manner. Now, I didn't want this power. Certainly didn't ask for it, yet it was thrust upon me without my consent, as I was literally thrown in at the deep end and left to fend for myself for what has surely turned out to be the world's most terrifying train journey, where each carriage seems to have its own unique hell designed to torment us. But I think I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Let me take you back to when this nightmare first began. I woke up with a start, my body drenched in sweat, yet freezing and shivering at the same time. Obnoxiously loud music from my phone blared right into my ears, making me wince even as my eyes rapidly fluttered to clear my hazy vision. Muffled grumbling rose up from the passengers around me as I fumbled with my phone, whose harsh glare ripped through the dark, burning my bleary and crusted eyes. My thumb slid over the slippery screen, finally shutting off the offending noise. Man, fuck telemarketers who call at 12.01am. Oh, my bladder seemed like it was going to explode and shower my innards with urine, so I swung my legs around and jumped down, wincing at the strange crick in my neck. The train lurched as I landed, almost throwing me off balance and sending me careening into the old woman curled up on the bottom berth but I put my hands on the seat above her and held on. Gingerly, I turned my head and looked out the tinted windows, to spot tiny balls of light bobbing away in the vast sea of inky darkness as the train rumbled and tore through the sparsely populated countryside. Just how fast was this going? Can it really reach speeds this high? I tied my hair up into a ponytail, slipped my feet into my shoes and without bothering to tie the laces, began shuffling towards the toilet. Curtains drawn, lights switched off. Almost everyone was slumbering at this point in time. Well, almost everybody. Someone else was awake at this ungodly hour, rummaging through his luggage near the door on the other end. I ducked as feet jutted out from a berth above me and almost smacked me in the face, and continued walking towards the door that opened up to the space where the toilet was located. My hand was on the handle of the door when I noticed it. A squishing sound that rose up from my shoes as my feet felt like they were being forcibly pulled down. I bowed my head and stared at the floor. From the tiny gap between the door and the PVC flooring, a bubbling, tar-like liquid was leaking out towards me. What the fuck? I pulled my shoe up and the liquid stretched and stuck to it like chewing gum forming spindly little stalactites and stalagmites that joined at near imperceptible points. I put my foot down, squelching the liquid with a horrible sound, and prepared to swing the door open when even more of the liquid rushed out, painting my shoes with a thick coat of the darkest black I had ever seen. What in the world was happening here? Well, I didn't get the time to contemplate on the weirdness of it all as the slow and steady stream of the liquid turned into a fiery jet, like water from a fireman's hose, crashing into my shins, making me scream, but more from a searing pain than the shock. Well, the thing was hot, and it felt like my legs had been sprayed by a flamethrower. I stumbled backwards, and almost immediately a high-pitched screech exploded from the back of the coach like a gunshot and ripped through the narrow hallway. The man I'd just seen was now slathered with the black liquid, yelling and writhing on the floor, but only making things worse for himself in the process as his skin boiled and peeled off, leaving behind angry-looking red splotches which were quickly gobbled up by the black liquid. I would have thrown up if my body wasn't too terrified to do so. Curious heads popped out through narrow slits between drawn curtains to investigate the commotion, while I cried and gritted my teeth to block out the mind-numbing pain and scrambled to my feet to get away from this thing. Oh, what's happening here? Look, he's hurt. Someone help him. What is that thing? Is that oil? Ah, it's hot. Get away from it. The liquid was starting to lash other people now, and the cacophony of screams which erupted forced others to wake up. 
I was about halfway back to my seat when a loud rumbling emerged from the rattling door, drowning out the anguish-filled yelling of the victims of the liquid. The door groaned and gave way, flying into the air and crashing onto the floor with a loud clang as the liquid gushed in, flooding the compartment, reaching up to my knees in height. Sweat rushed out of every pore in my body, and my knees trembled, threatening to give out and send me tumbling to the floor as the liquid scorched my flesh, causing my synapses to fire like crazy, pretty much short-circuiting my brain. The liquid reached up to my waist now, melting my jeans and fusing the fabric with my sizzling flesh, making my legs wobble like melted jelly. What's happening? Someone pull the chain. Stop the train. It's, it's not working. Fuck. I needed to get to higher ground or else I was going to melt and get swept away by this fluid. It seemed like others had the same idea as the chaos in the compartment seemed to be aimed at getting to the top berths. With my hands quivering, I turned to my right and pumped my weakening muscles to wade through this bizarrely sticky liquid to climb onto a top berth when I noticed something from the corner of my eye. Some people were trying to help the man who was splashed with the liquid right after me. And to my horror, black, tendril-like projections of the liquid shot out of the surface of its ever-expanding pool, reaching the roof of the carriage before zooming towards the struggling group and wrapping around them like fiery boa constrictors. My mouth dropped open as I watched the hapless group get jerked under the pool of the liquid one by one, with loud splashes by things that bore a shocking resemblance to sentience. What the fuck? And then it got worse as my ears were assaulted by the nauseating sound of metallic screeching and blades whirring and slicing through flesh. A faint dash of red struggled against the overwhelming blackness of the liquid before being consumed by it as the group was cut to pieces with surgeon-like precision. A solitary head flew into the air, squishing against the roof and leaving a small trail of blood before plopping back into the liquid, its wide, lifeless eyes rattling my soul. The screaming of the people trapped here in this compartment somehow found a way to increase in volume. One woman, overwhelmed with pain, collapsed onto the floor, her body sizzling and melting right before my eyes. I shook my head. Move. 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 With a Herculean effort, I put my feet on the bottom seat and pushed myself up, soon feeling arms around me as the person on the berth above tried to pull me up. My body cried out in relief as it ended its contact with the fiery liquid, but it was short-lived. The eyes of the person pulling me up widened, and before I even had the chance to think why that was, I was yanked back into the darkness, my head slamming against the bottom seat as the horrifying tendrils finally made their way towards me. My entire body was aflame. It felt like I'd been dropped into a vat of acid. I could feel my very eyelids melting under the heat of the liquid. Just when I thought I was going to die like this, the tendrils snaked around my body, reaching my head and forcing their way into my mouth. The liquid poured in, singeing my esophagus. The tendrils pulled harder and harder, and the last thing I heard before fading away was the sound of my jaw cracking into pieces. The train lurched as I landed on my feet, almost throwing me off balance and sending me careening into... Wait, what? My heart hammered in my chest as images of my death flashed through my mind. What was that? Was that all just a dream? The horror I'd been through had felt far too real to have been just a dream, and tears rolled down my face as if to reaffirm that fact. A lump formed in my throat and expanded making breathing itself an extraordinarily arduous task. I closed my eyes and took a couple of deep breaths to calm down. Just a dream. Just a dream. Oh, how could it have been just a dream if I was out of bed and standing on my own two feet? If it wasn't real, then what in the world are these memories in my brain? Well, only one way to find out. With extreme trepidation, I popped my head out and almost screamed at what I saw. Holy shit. It was all exactly the same. 
The same guy rummaging through his luggage. The same feet jutting out of the top berth some ten meters away. Fuck. The sound of the liquid bubbling and streaming through the gap is what convinced me it was going to happen again. Without wasting even a second, I climbed back to my seat faster than anything I'd ever done in my life. And then I screamed my lungs off. The person opposite me shot up straight, looking around wildly to see what was happening. It was a woman who was looking at me with disgust on her face. Don't touch the liquid, I shouted. She looked at me like I'd grown another head. I didn't care. Everybody, climb to the top berths. Don't touch the liquid. She opened her mouth to ask me what was wrong with me, but was cut off by screaming. Terrifyingly familiar screaming. That man must have been splashed by the liquid now. The woman jumped down to check out the noise. Please, don't, I shouted. Come back. She disregarded me, but only momentarily, and came running back when she saw the liquid and what it was capable of her eyes wide with disbelief. The elderly couple below us needed help getting to the top. It was a race against time. The liquid was already starting to pool beneath our seats, and the door was going to come crashing down any second. The door burst open when I was pulling the wife up, and the liquid flooded the compartment as soon as the woman helped the husband climb up to her seat, who groaned as his aged muscles stretched around his fragile bones. We sat frightened out of our minds, listening to the death rows of people caught by the liquid and the oddly metallic slashing of the tendrils. The black tar-like fluid was only inches below the top berths when it stopped rising, and a suffocating silence descended upon the compartment, with the only sound being the sloshing and bubbling of the liquid. Everybody waited with bated breath, wondering what was going to happen next. I gasped as dark tendrils leapt out of the liquid, latching onto my seat and missing my leg by inches before retreating. I backed up, my left hand bumping against something hard, right where my pillow should be. It was a leather diary, one that I'd never seen before in my life. Again, what the fuck? Oh, this night just keeps getting weirder and weirder. At least now I know why my neck was so damn stiff. I flipped the diary open. It was blank, save for one page. The first one, which had a crude figure of the train, with strange labels on each compartment scribbled in the most atrocious handwriting I'd ever seen. But the thing that drew my attention more than anything else were the words hastily scrawled on the top. Words that were full of panic. Words that screamed at the reader... The train is trying to kill you. Do you want to live? Part 2 As I sat gawking at the shabbily drawn diagram of the train in the diary, wondering who made it, why they chose to leave this with me, and how exactly they seemed to know what was going on, well, the boiling liquid receded, leaving behind a trail of stomach-churning violence. And despite the burnt corpses, melted flesh, and torn apart limbs strewn across the floor, all the passengers collectively heaved a sigh of relief, such that it seemed the metal carriage itself had exhaled, deflating its metaphorical shoulders in relaxation. The departure of the murderous fluid ignited an explosive uproar which swept over the compartment like wildfire. People sobbed at the loss of their loved ones, cried out at the sheer inexplicable nature of the horror that had visited them, shouted irrational suggestions for what should be done next, and picked fights with each other to direct their rage at a more accessible target. But I was oblivious to all that, fixated as I was on the leather journal splayed out on my lap, scratching my head in confusion at what seemed to be an instruction manual. The person who wrote this obviously wanted to survive whatever was happening in this train, but I was in such a hurry while writing this that I couldn't make head or tail of what the hastily scribbled words were trying to tell me. Consider this, for example. Right below the diagram of the train were these words. One step backward, two steps forward, one step forward, three steps backward. What the hell does this mean? Was this a riddle of some sort? God, why couldn't they just leave instructions that were slightly clearer than this? 
what I wouldn't give for clear-cut rules and guidelines to follow to get out of this hell. There were some things that were a bit easier to understand, though, like the eighth compartment on the diagram was labelled Burning Liquid Reach Top Birth, and had a fucked-up stick figure pointing at it, announcing where we were. What are you looking at? The sudden appearance of that voice almost made me jump out of my skin. Instinctively, clutching my chest, I turned to my right and saw it was the woman from the berth directly opposite mine, who, while I'd been busy poring over the contents of the diary, had helped the elderly woman down and taken her place beside me. Um, oh, hi, I spoke weakly. Hi yourself, she replied, gently smiling, the action causing the mole on her chin to come tantalizingly close to her full lips. So, what are you looking at? Can I see it? She snatched the diary from my hands and began reading it before I could do so much as utter a disgruntled whine. What the fuck is this? She asked accusingly. Did you know what was going to happen here? Well, I had absolutely no clue. I mean, I did, but not because of this diary, which is not actually even mine. It just, well, happened to be on my seat. My voice tapered off at the end. Even I understood how ridiculous that sounded. So, how else did you know about the demonic oil? She asked, her brow furrowing with suspicion. I, um, saw it. I saw the future? I bit my lip and muttered it half-heartedly. She stared at me with an unreadable expression on her face. I know it sounds unbelievable, but it's true, I protested. I saw myself die. My jaw was ripped apart by that thing. That vision was the only reason I was able to save myself. She shook her head as if she couldn't believe what she was about to say. You know, normally most people would have you locked up in an asylum for saying something that insane, but these aren't exactly normal times, are they? And I'm certainly not most people. Who are you? I wondered out loud. Trisha. She shook my hand firmly, but in a reassuring manner. Maya, I replied. Well, Mayor, seems like we're on the same side, she said, a wriggling finger pointing at the two of us. I saw how hard you tried to get everyone away from that oil, so I'm choosing to trust you, even though I'm not entirely sold on your story, particularly that part about you um, seeing the future. Well, that wasn't very surprising. So, if you're willing to work with me, then we can start trying to crack the mystery of this thing, she continued. Oh, and fast, because that oil is going to come back, right? She pointed at the five o'clock that was scrawled in a corner and circled five times. Um, it's a cycle that repeats every five minutes, I said, the gears in my mind turning. Then that leaves us with less than two minutes before the liquid reappears. So, what do we do? I'll go warn the other passengers and tell them to stay on the upper berths, she answered. Meanwhile, I suggest you keep looking at that page. Try and see if you can figure anything else out. She handed me the diary and hopped down like a rabbit, leaving me alone to deal with the confusing mess of squiggly lines that was this page. I heard her shouting in the distance, and then she was back, tapping me on the leg to help get the elderly couple up on her seat. Strange how humans can quickly adapt to a change in their environment. The reaction of the passengers to the return of the liquid was a lot more subdued this time, and not a single one of us fell prey to its heat or its demonic limbs that groped around for anyone foolish enough to get close to it. The second attack of the liquid ended with a whimper, leaving behind a frightened but mostly safe group of people. It's the coaches, I whispered after things had returned to relative normalcy. What? Trisha asked. The steps. It's the coaches. Look, I exclaimed, pointing at the diagram of the train. They're numbered. They're the steps. Have to be. What do you mean? One step backward, two steps forward. One step forward, three steps backward. Um, it's talking about the compartments, I replied excitedly. You mean if we went to the compartment immediately to our back, we ended up going two coaches forward, she asked doubtfully. Exactly. Look, it's some teleportion stuff, as unbelievable as that sounds. And this one here. I jerked my finger at the first coach, which, like the five, was already heavily circled with arrows pointing at it. Uh, 
It's our target, I think. If we want to stop whatever the fuck is going on here, we have to get there. She tapped the watch on her wrist. Then we better hurry up, right? We decided to push through the back door, as it seemed to be the safer choice. Like the stick figure in the drawing of the train pointed out, we were in the eighth compartment, that is, second to last carriage in the train. If we went forward, we could end up being thrown outside, as there really weren't three carriages behind us. So backwards it was, which should send us two coaches forward if my assumption was correct. Oh, I would have certainly questioned my sanity for going along with something this dangerous, if only I'd had time to do so, but considering that we were on a lethal time limit, I ignored the warning bells going off within me, clutched the diary tightly in my right hand, and followed Trisha as she slung her backpack over her shoulders and strode towards the back of the carriage where we found other people who had the same idea, arguing with others who believed that it would indeed be a stupidly dangerous thing to do. So the argument that I wanted to have with my conscience ended up being played out right in front of me. It's too dangerous. We don't know what's out there. Well, we can't just sit here and wait for it to happen again, can we? What if you leave and that sets off something even worse? We'll all end up dead. We are going to die anyway if we don't do something to stop this. Trisha passed them, mumbling, Excuse me, under her breath. A rotund, balding, middle-aged man stepped in front of her, his bushy moustache quivering with alarm. You, he yelled. You're the one who warned us that the oil was returning. How did you know? She shrugged. Just a hunch. Aren't you glad that it saved your life? His face reddened with rage. Where do you think you're going? Out, she replied with a straight face. I'm not going to sit here waiting for my turn to die. Step aside. Well, he looked ready to explode when she cut him off. Look, that liquid is going to come back again in a couple of minutes, so we really don't have the time to be arguing here. Step aside and let us through. We'll let you know what we find on the other side. If you think I'm just going to let two go out... His eyes widened when she pulled out a gun from her backpack and aimed it at him. Holy shit, I whispered, as everyone around her backed away in fear. She sighed. I know this makes me look very suspicious, but that's a risk I'm willing to take at this point. You all should run up to the top berths, hunker down, and the two of us will get back to you, um, eventually. I stared at her in shock. Come on, Mayor, let's go. She tugged my hand and dragged me outside. Where the fuck did you get that gun? I shouted after she'd slammed the door shut behind her. The rumbling and rattling of the train was much more pronounced here, outside the air-conditioned compartment. How did you get it past security? Who even are you? She sighed. Listen, Mayor, we both have our secrets. There are things you don't know about me, and there are things I don't know about you. You see... Normally, that'd be a case for extreme suspicion between the two of us, but right now, with the situation as fucked as it is, we can both either take a blind leap of faith or sink down into the abyss. What'll it be? What are you going to do? Think fast, because I need you here with me. Our conversation was interrupted by a cacophony of screams and warnings behind us. That liquid was invading our compartment once again, yet here on the other side, there was nothing. It was as if the black tar had just magically appeared beneath the door and started flooding the carriage. I had to rub my eyes to make sure I wasn't dreaming. Fuck. Should we wait for the liquid to disappear and get everyone out here where it seems to be safer? I asked. Well, it depends. What does the diary say about it? She countered. I flipped it open, my eyes rocketing towards the spindly lines connecting two carriages in the diagram. Safe spaces aren't safe. This was the label above them. I knew that because by this time I'd memorized pretty much the entire page, but the comforting safety out here had deceived my memories. Well, that answers the question, doesn't it? I nodded. There goes my opportunity to relieve my bladder. If things continue to proceed at this pace, I'll almost certainly wet my pants. I looked longingly at the toilet, and then shook my head. We stepped through the flimsy metal frame surrounding the coupling mechanism that connected the two train coaches, and suddenly my hypothesis proved to be accurate. 
There was an intense build-up of pressure in my eardrums, which released with a painful pop, making my head feel incredibly dizzy. And by the time I stumbled out near the door, I noticed that the scene was familiar, yet noticeably different from the one I'd seen from the other end of the trembling iron bridge. This is it, isn't it? Trisha huffed, resting with her hands on her knees. Yes, I panted. We should be at the door at the front end of the sixth compartment in the train. Uh, only one way to know for sure, she said as she swung open the door, which bumped against a hollowed-out corpse. I yelped as I saw the ghastly body with its ribcage opened up and pock-marked intestines sprawled out around it. There were chunks of flesh missing all over the body, and a hole had been chewed out in its left cheek, revealing a gum full of missing teeth. His limbs had been similarly cut open, with bones and tendons exposed to the natural forces. We didn't even have enough time to process this as we instantly came face to face with a terrified and angry bunch who gathered up and looked ready to charge us with a steel water bottle and long tiffin boxes. Back up, Trisha screamed, pointing the pistol in their direction. They obeyed, their jaws dropping at the sight of the gun. Who are you? One of the men snarled. We came from the other compartment, I replied. What happened here? They looked at each other with fear and anxiety writ clear upon their sweat-riddled faces. Trisha groaned. Our compartment was flooded with boiling oil that caught and dragged people to their deaths. They gawped at her. She continued. So can we please move on and start talking freely? They started whispering to each other, which made her turn towards me. What does the diary say about this coach? And man, hide, I answered. Oh, really helpful, she said before raising her voice. Hey, how long ago did it happen? What? The man who addressed us asked. Whatever happened that led to this? She pointed at the corpse at her feet. How long ago was it? Almost five minutes, he replied. Oh, fuck, she swore. Let's go, Mayor. We're running through. She pushed past them, ignoring their outraged grumbling, and dashed down the length of the carriage, with me hot on her heels, the both of us shouting warnings that there was going to be a repeat of the hell they'd just been through, a hell that we weren't even aware of. Running down the carriage, I caught glimpses of eaten-out corpses and curtains stained with blood. We were about halfway down when we noticed that the compartment was starting to get a little darker, then screams erupted from everywhere around us. I slowed down and looked up at the light fixtures, with my heart almost leaping out of my mouth at the terrifying and disgusting sight. A dark shadow had passed over them, a mobile cloud the colour of blackest onyx that steadily spread its malignant influence, plunging the compartment in ever-deepening darkness. Ants. Thousands and thousands of the little insects had exploded out of the little gaps in the metallic structure of the carriage and were now swarming the place. Some of them, no, a lot of them, fell down from the roof and slipped into my clothes, sending shivers down my spine as they skittered all over my back. I gasped in pain as they bit down, sending red-hot pain flooding through my system. But why did it hurt so much? Well, I soon found out as one of them landed on my hand and sunk its little mandibles into my index finger, the wound instantly bulging out as it filled with pus and throbbed like a fucked-up little heart. The blinding agony made me lose control of my senses, and I pierced my pants. What kind of ants were these? I winced at the pain, and the action made me look at my surroundings. The ants were everywhere, rushing out of every little orifice in the train, biting their merry way into any human they could grab onto. Covered in wounds, Trisha and I waddled over to the other end and pulled the door open, only to come face to face with a monstrosity that defied all laws of reality. It was a humanoid ant, so large its antennae scraped the roof as it walked on its thin, hairy legs. It had a face that was astonishingly human, stretching and struggling to fight against the ant-like features that threatened to overwhelm it. It brought its sharp, clawed hand up, its thorax rippling with emotion, and sliced through Trisha, cleanly cutting her into two halves, 
causing her organs to slip out and fall to the floor with a nauseating squishing sound, or before she even had the chance to fire at it. And then it screeched, making my ears bleed, and began stalking me. My knees shook wildly and gave out, sending me crashing to the floor. The last thing I saw was the Ant-Man grinning, its human-like teeth glistening menacingly before it stabbed me in the throat. Oh, fuck, she swore. Let's go, Mayor. We're running through. My breath caught in my throat as I was once again slammed back into the past after experiencing the future in a nightmarish vision. I put my hand on Trisha's shoulder, my grip vice-like in strength. No, I stated emphatically. We'll never make it. Did you have another vision? I bobbed my head. Ant-Man, hide. Oh, damn. We should have erred on the side of caution and deferred to the diary. Trisha understood and... Instead of barreling through, we decided to hide. We warned the others that the Ant-Man was coming again, and to our surprise, they believed us straight away. I guess some people do make smart decisions in the face of impending doom. We bolted to our left, drew the curtains, and sat next to people who looked at us with curiosity and fear. It didn't take long for the ants to arrive, scurrying out of whatever little interdimensional holes they were hiding in and overwhelming every surface in the compartment. They began to bite, every single sting as painful as I'd remembered from the vision, but other than a whimper here and there, we mostly stayed quiet. We couldn't say the same for the others in this compartment. Maybe they didn't understand the importance of silence. Maybe the pain was too much to bear, or maybe the fear overpowered their faculties, but a lot of them screamed, and the ants zoomed in on that noise devouring the culprits and leaving behind empty husks like the one we saw near the door. And then came the Ant-Man, his powerful legs scratching and pounding the floor. The screams would every now and then be interspersed with the powerful slashes of the hulking beast as it sliced its victims to clean pieces, like an experienced butcher. We sat frozen in fear, the pain from the bites on our bodies all but forgotten as it clopped past us its giant shadow crawling beneath the curtains and caressing our feet. Every second felt like an eternity, but even that never-ending time passed, and the, and the monstrous critters vanished as fast as they come, leaving behind little evidence of their existence, except broken bodies and destroyed lives. Trisha and I hobbled out of the carriage before people could finish processing their grief and begin peppering us with questions, but not before telling them that the key to surviving this was to shut up and hide. Oh, Trisha groaned, gently caressing a past-filled blister on her face. Just how many of these compartments will we have to clear before we end this? I didn't even want to think about that. Part 3 Our encounter with the Ant-Man had shaken Trisha far more than I'd initially realised. Faced with her own mortality... The facade of arrogant self-confidence she'd so carefully built up around herself had cracked, turning her white as a sheet. She leaned back against the door at the back end of the sixth compartment, and took a second to get her bearings even as the wounds inflicted on her by the tiny ants continued to throb disgustingly. Did I really die? she asked, her voice trembling with fear and disbelief. I nodded nervously. The last thing I needed was for her to lose faith in herself and get us killed out here. She shook her head slowly. It's because I'm not prepared. Because I don't have proper supplies with me. I'm not normally this sloppy, trust me. I was about to voice my support for her when I noticed something on her forehead. A wound or a scar that pressed from beneath her skin and threatened to burst out and spread across her head. But then it was gone in a flash. A trick of the light, maybe. She breathed, an action full of renewed resolve. Let's go. I don't want to find out what the diary meant with safe spaces not being safe. Maybe we should slow down a little, I said as I tried to keep up with her, the bite marks on my own body left by those loathsome ants affecting my usual deep speed in a not insignificant way. No, it'll be fine, she countered. Wait, I yelled, pulling her arm to stop her. 
we're not going to rush this. It'll end up getting us killed. Well, you can always see the future and stop this from happening, can't you? She asked sardonically. No, I don't enjoy being killed over and over again, I exclaimed. What tough shit, she shouted. Get over it. Every second we waste, more people get killed by whatever's causing this. We need to move. Now. What exactly will happen if we're the ones who end up dead? I screamed back. With my vision, we at least have a fighting chance, but, but it'll all be for nothing if we die. Well, what do you want? No more bum rush in this, I replied. No more taking decisions without me, and we always do what the diary tells us to do. She looked at me, I mean, really looked at me, like she was acknowledging me for the first time. All right, Mayor, we'll do it your way. So what does your precious diary say about compartment number four? I rolled my eyes. It's not mine. You should know that by now, and let me check. My eyes scanned the page. Wow. Wow, what? Touch wood. Get fucked. Whoever wrote this has a terrible sense of humour. Getting to the front door of the fourth compartment was as nauseating an experience as the first time we jumped through space, but recovery was much quicker this time, and we were ready to encounter the coach after less than half a minute. Touch wood, get fucked, Trisha whispered like it was a mantra. Oh, let's see what this means. She pushed the door open again, and we entered a forest. There's, um, really no other way to put it. Thick trunks of rootless trees of varying shades of brown had pierced the solid metal frame of the train and wound their way through the entire length of the carriage, turning the place into an intricate, nigh unnavigable maze of wood that had sprouted innumerable branches that merrily stabbed their way through padded seats, suitcases, and even unsuspecting humans, whose blood only served to feed the demon tree, as on the wood close to every corpse bloomed a giant crimson red flower that twitched ever so slightly like someone moaning after a scrumptious meal. Leaves, some fresh and young like flattened emeralds, some wilted and aged like dry cow dung, desperately clung to the tree as they fluttered in the dusty wind that came gushing in through the myriad holes in the train which continued to traverse the arid countryside at an impossibly high speed. This can't be real, I mumbled under my trembling breath. You're right, Trisha replied just as softly. I don't think the diary was being literal. So, what do we do? I asked. Wait for the clock to run out? Let's find out how much sand's left in the hourglass first, she replied before shouting, Hey, anyone still alive? The only reply we got was a thick log of wood which shot across the compartment like a bullet, right in front of her face, before embedding itself above the glass window. Long greenish vines quickly followed, tying themselves to the piece of wood before expanding and becoming a generic part of the sentient tree. I clamped my mouth with my hand and preemptively muffled the involuntary scream that threatened to rip from my throat. I guess we'll just have to wait this one out, Trisha muttered nervously. Safe spaces aren't safe. And that was when we found the terrifying truth of that statement. A bone-rattling roar boomed from somewhere behind us rooting me to the spot and causing cold sweat to gush down my forehead and into my eyes. I whirled around and saw a freaking bear standing on the metal platform above the coupling connecting the two trembling train coaches. He was big, much bigger than any bear I'd ever seen, with bloodshot eyes and thick fur matted with gore. The train groaned and shifted as it took a step in our direction. Oh, fuck, Trisha swore as she pulled her pistol up and fired at the bear who just shook off the bullets like it meant nothing to him. Oh, caught between the devil and the deep blue sea, I thought, my heart quickly sinking into the said metaphorical ocean. Is this it? Is this how we die? Even a vision can't save us from this. Wait. A light bulb went off in my head, its warmth flooding me with energy. Let's go in, I said excitedly. I have an idea. What? Trisha screamed as she popped off the last couple of shots in her magazine, which she promptly, and with extreme fluidity, changed in a flash. Meanwhile, I tore out a page from the back of the diary, 
crumped it up into a ball and tossed it at the monstrous tree somewhere to the left. As soon as the wood attacked it with a sharp crack, I took a step in, avoiding touching the tree with utmost caution. My heart pounded in my chest as I waited for the attack, which never came. Yes, it worked. I didn't know whether it could only attack one target at a time, or whether it just can't sense two stimuli closely spaced together, but considering that our lives were on the line, I assumed the latter. After quickly telling Trisha about my plan, we began moving in, one carefully placed step at a time, leaving the bear snarling at us right at the doorstep, and tearing page after page from the diary to distract the monstrous tree as we moved deeper into the compartment. Our progress was slow, and it almost took us half an hour to get to the midpoint. My visions helped us a lot, every misplaced step, every stumble resulting in a painful death that, although we avoided, ended up leaving a scar in my memory. I'm sure it'd take a lifetime of therapy to get over all this trauma, but living long enough to deal with that pain would be a blessing in itself. This is exactly like that scene from Ocean's Twelve, you know. Trisha remarked, her body contorted into odd angles at my instruction to avoid hitting the wood. I grinned, thoroughly enjoying the first moment of levity since this had started. Well, as we reached the end of the compartment, I realized we hadn't come across a single survivor in this carriage. Everyone here had been murdered by the sentient tree, with beautiful and yet vile crimson flowers blooming on every single seat in the coach. This is how it's going to be from here on. Are the monstrous traps waiting for us going to get worse the closer we get to our destination? I hope not, because the next one we'd be hitting was compartment number two. So, what horror awaits us next? Trisha asked as she stretched her tired muscles after we'd exited the forest in compartment number four. It's not real, I replied. Great, hallucinations, just what we need she said, running her fingers through her luscious hair. We'll have to double back to five when we get to two, right? I nodded. Yes. One step forward, three steps backward. One step backward, two steps forward. When we get to two, we move to five, then three, and finally one. What happens after that? How exactly were we going to stop whatever had started this? Oh. I didn't want to imagine just how powerful the creator of all this must be. We left the area before that damn bear could come, arriving at the window door to compartment two. So we just have to walk back to get to five, don't we? Trisha asked. Doesn't that mean we won't even have to enter two? Well, that's how it should work, yes, I replied. If we walk from two to one, that is, to one step forward, we should arrive back at five. So that's what we did, only to hit a wall, a literal wall, albeit an invisible one that halted our progress. Looks like we'll have to enter two, and then exit out the same door to actually trigger the transportation, I guessed. We doubled back to the door to compartment two and tried to peer through its window, but we couldn't because the area beyond was completely shrouded in darkness. I took my phone out, switched on its flashlight and swung the door open. The light feebly pushed back against the dark, but couldn't even make a slight dent in the overwhelming blackness of the coach. I sighed and took a step forward, only to find myself in my childhood dining room, where my mother was sitting with a smile on her face and had my favourite meal, Amritsari kulchas, displayed invitingly on the table as bright sunlight streamed through the windows, making my mother's beautiful face glow with a golden hue. Hey, Maya, she said, her voice as musical as I remembered. How are you, baby? Not real. Not real. Not real. Aren't you hungry? She asked, her brown eyes twinkling. Food's gonna get cold, you know. She's dead. She's dead. She's dead. I tried to tell myself to run away, that this won't end well, but my feet seemed to move of their own accord, and soon I was digging into the food without a care in the world. How could it not be real? I could smell the food, taste its spice on my tongue, feel the sun stinging my skin. How is this not real? And even if it isn't real, is it all that bad? 
Why couldn't I just stay here? Why is the outside with its unrelenting demonic horrors any better or any more real than this? Your dad's coming home, Mum said, shattering my heart with that statement. No, no, don't go there. He really wants to talk to you, she added. He does? I asked. Really? No, no, he doesn't need me. He can't. Because he's dead too, remember? Even after what happened, I asked weakly, my voice raspy on the edge of breaking down. Honey? Mum put her hand on top of mine. Of course he does. You don't really blame yourself for what happened, do you? I looked away guiltily. Because you should. My eyes shut up, watering with hurt at what she'd just uttered. Excuse me? I croaked. You should, because it's all your fault, isn't it? The saccharine tone of her voice made that sound even more fucked up. I watched, stunned out of my wits, as she casually brought a stainless steel fork up and stabbed me in the hand with it, nailing it to the wooden table, which began to stain with my blood. I let out a piercing screech as agony rushed up my nerves. It's all your fault, you dyke cunt, she thundered, her voice morphing, layers both high and low pitched, settling on it, making it sound disjointed, inhuman, demonic. You remember what happened, don't you? Mom, please, I pleaded. That night you came out, announced how fucked in the head you were, how it broke your loving father's heart. How we drank that night. How we crashed the car. Her face began to warp as her teeth fell out. Eyes sank into the skull and cheeks puffed up as her hair began to wobble from her skull. You killed us, you bitch. She twisted the fork, making my eyes water with the pain. No, no, no. But you didn't die, did you? My torture continued as my mum's face snapped and popped as it transformed into that of my father, as I'd seen him moments before his cremation. You survived, like the abomination you are. You should have died that day. I started to viciously tear my hair out of my skull as my tormentor hurled insults at me, each and every word measured and sharpened, tailored to carve a piece out of my soul. Stop! Stop! I begged, but the relentless verbal assault continued unabated. I don't know how long I suffered through that torture, but I'm pretty sure I was on the brink of losing my sanity when Trisha invaded my personal hell, shot the thing pretending to be my parents in the face, and dragged me out of compartment number two. I was down on my knees, sobbing uncontrollably, having lost all sense of time, and hell had even forgotten who I was, where I was stuck, and what I should have been doing, when Trisha slapped me across the face, hard. I can't tell you that wasn't real, she said, holding my head in her hands and staring into my eyes. Because you know it wasn't, but that doesn't make it any less real, does it? We know that your family would never say that shit to you, but their voices still echo inside your head, right? But Maya, we can't dwell on that, understand? Not now. Please. Help me end this. Help me stop whoever's doing this, okay? I wiped my eyes and nodded vigorously. She smiled. Good girl, now, come on. There's still two more compartments to go till we reach the end of our journey. Part 4 My parents' voices still reverberated inside my skull as we stood outside the door to compartment 5, ready to confront whatever fresh hell the train had in store for us there. The horrors we'd just witnessed had taken its toll on Trisha too, if her ashen face and trembling hands were any indication. But I could see she was putting on a brave front, and so I felt obligated to do the same. I agreed with her. First, we needed to find a way to put an end to this nightmare. Then we can take all the time in the world to ponder on our experiences here. Mosh pit, I said as Trisha glanced at me. She nodded and opened the door. As expected, there was pandemonium in the carriage, but a quick scan with my eyes showed no signs of the supernatural. Maybe we'd arrived during the cool-down period. The chaos here consisted of the passengers squaring off against each other, their angry voices rising up to a deafening din. Some of them were shoving each other, 
Some had been tied up in their seats and they all pretty much ignored our presence. A surprising first for us in this journey. What in the world is happening here? Trisha wondered out loud. She ducked sideways and caught hold of a frightened looking teenage girl, asking her the same thing. You don't, you don't know? She stammered. Trisha shrugged. We're not from this compartment. The girl's mouth dropped in shock at this. Really? What's happening over there? Is everything normal outside? Did you guys try to stop the train by pulling the chain? We tried, but it's not working for us. Hey, hey, Trisha interrupted. Look, slow down, okay? Start by telling us what happened here. It keeps repeating over and over again. and It just started out of nowhere, she replied, her lips quivering. One second we're all sitting playing cards, the next everyone just... She was cut off by a siren so loud its vibrations rattled the windows. What the... I held onto the seat close to me to steady myself before turning to look at the girl. How long ago did it happen last? The only reply she gave me was a hateful snarl, before launching at me, wrapping her bony hands around my throat and sending us both crashing down to the floor. The sudden attack knocked the wind out of my lungs, making it harder for me to fight her off. But Trisha was on her in an instant, grabbing her by the waist and lifting her off me. The girl responded by shrieking and raking her crusted fingernails across Trisha's wrists. I lumbered up onto my feet, gasping and coughing as air rushed into my lungs, causing my chest to expand, sending waves of pleasure through my body. But I didn't get a chance to enjoy this as someone else slammed into my side causing my head to bump sickeningly against the metal railing set up to help people climb to the top bunk. The man who had jumped on me began to rain blows down upon my face, and the pus-filled blister left on my cheek courtesy of the ants burst, and my tongue was subsequently coated with a gag-inducing liquid. I put my hands up to protect myself, so he started punching my sides, and I'm pretty sure he must have cracked a couple of ribs before Trisha knocked him out with a carefully placed kick to the point where his jaw connected to his skull. Get up, she screamed as she fought off more attackers. We need to move, now. Taking the support of the seat, I pulled myself up, fighting off the dizziness that threatened to slam me into unconsciousness. Scenes of senseless violence played out in the carriage as every passenger went frickin' berserk, began attacking anyone close to them. I saw a prepubescent kid stabbing an old man's eyes with his fingernails. I saw a mother bash her infant's head against the window, splattering the glass with blood and sticky bits of grey matter. Near the door we wanted to exit through was a man sitting on top of another man, stabbing him repeatedly with a jagged shard of glass. Trisha swung into action, easily and quickly beating down anyone who stepped up to her. It was stunning to watch a trained fighter use their skills. It was quite unlike the movies. There were no wasted motions, no ostentatious moves, just precise clinical strikes that disabled her attackers in the blink of an eye. A sharp jab to the throat, a swift kick to the knee, a flurry of punches to the side of the head, and it was over. There was a bizarre musical quality to the cracking of skulls and snapping of bones, and this realization made me feel very guilty because... These people were innocent civilians, caught up in some supernatural insanity. Trisha didn't share this guilt, nor did she have any hesitation as she beat the shit out of over a dozen people to get us to the aptly named Mosh Pit. My body ached like a mother, while well, Trisha didn't seem to have been phased by any of this at all, and on the contrary seems to have enjoyed the little workout. This train was fucking with our conscience. I was about to make some silly quip about her fighting skills when I felt utter dread wash over me. All through this night I'd seen things I'd never even imagined. Things that would haunt my nightmares for the rest of my life. Things that made me feel the sort of fear that I'd never experienced before in my life. But it was all nothing compared to the abject, irrational terror that I'd felt at that moment. It was a sort of primal fear that cornered animals feel when they know they're about to die but can't see their predators and so just don't know where the attack is coming from. Cold sweat trickled down my face as I stood rooted to the spots, wondering what the fuck was happening. What was responsible for this? Was it the bear? <laughs> Couldn't be. I'd faced the bear before, but 
this wasn't the same. This fear slithered its way inside and squeezed my heart, and even standing on my feet put a strain on my body. Just when I thought it couldn't get any worse, it did. I spotted him out of the corner of my eye, coming down the passageway, connecting Coach 5 to Coach 4. He was a man, sort of, as was evident with his hairy naked body and his dick flapping about as he walked. But that's where the similarities with humans ended. He had a lion's head, big and furry, and his feet ended in razor-sharp claws where his toes should have been. Dear God, Trisha whispered when she saw him. What is that thing? That thing roared, the sound instantly bringing the both of us down to our knees. We waited helplessly as he approached us at a leisurely pace, confident at the fact we couldn't defy him. We really couldn't. Even the thought of running away made our innards shiver in fear. He got closer and closer, until I could feel his rancid breath on top of my head, its heat making me whimper. I then felt his clawed finger on my head, and he slowly brought it down to my face, cutting through the skin and causing me to bleed profusely without even trying. My brain didn't even have time to process this pain when his hand covered my face and he began to squeeze. I heard Trisha shout something, but it was far off as if she was at the top of a mountain in the distance. I felt his fingers digging into my skull, which began to snap and pop painfully before everything went dark. I didn't waste a second after I'd had this vision. Pulling Trisha's arm, I forced her back into the compartment where the violence was still in full swing. Having that vision had made me realize that we'd made a critical error. To get to coach number three, we had to exit out the back door, not the front door as we'd known. But that mistake had brought me face to face with the entity that I feared was the one controlling all this the sheer power that he emanated and the terror he inspired by just his presence was nothing short of extraordinary, even by the standards of this train that we'd gotten used to. However, knowing that he was the linchpin to this didn't alleviate any of my concerns. It only gave me more fear and anxiety. How are we supposed to stop this thing? Uh, we keep pushing forwards towards the first compartment, almost as if by instinct, but do we even know what the fuck we're doing here? Because it certainly didn't feel like it. What? Why are we heading back? Trisha asked as she punched an old woman in the face. What did you see? I'll tell you about it when we get to the other side, I shouted. And I did. After we'd fought our way back out through the carriage, I told her about what I'd seen why I felt he was the one responsible for all this, and how we'd made a mistake going in that direction. Maybe you forced us to make that error, Trisha suggested. Maybe it's scared that we're getting close to it. I shook my head. He didn't seem scared at all. If anything, he was arrogant. Yet he still decided to come personally and hunt us down, didn't he? She asked. I don't think he expected anyone to make it out of their compartment at all, let alone come this far. I think that's got him spooked. How do you figure that out? She grinned. Well, did you notice how the two of us were the only ones in compartment 5 to not go into a murderous frenzy after the siren sounded? Almost like the sound only affected those who were initially in that carriage and did nothing to outsiders like us. Hmm, that makes sense. But the question remains, why is it that only the two of us have been hopping carriages and no one else? I don't know, she admitted. But what I do know is that makes it all the more important for us to see this through to the end. I wasn't entirely convinced by that. That lion-headed man had sat me of almost all of my will with simply his presence. I think Trisha saw that, as she grabbed my hand and squeezed it reassuringly. We're almost at the end, Mayor. Please don't give up now. I nodded. Okay, let's do this. Do what, though? I hope we find the answer to that question before we get to our destination. Now, I know I say this a lot, but what the f- <laughs> Trisha said, her complete attention on the strange monstrosity in front of us in compartment number three. She was right. 
in that she, you know, we do utter those words a lot, but well, that doesn't mean that it isn't a hundred percent justified. This thing in front of us was, for the lack of a better word, half a human. He had two thick legs supporting a headless torso. I mean, oh, he wasn't headless per se. It was like his neck had swallowed his head, which then travelled down to his gut and tried to emerge out of his belly button, which in turn proceeded to transform into his mouth, perennially stuck in a shocked, oh, expression. The skin of his stomach stretched across his eyes, such that his entire torso rippled every time he blinked. And his arms had extended, splitting into multiple tentacle-like abnormalities that had stumps for hands, stumps that opened up into mouths with razor-sharp teeth. We watched as dozens of these mouths, attached to elongated, flailing tentacles, devoured everything in sight. And I mean everything. Passengers, padded seats, suitcases, hell, he even devoured half the roof of the carriage. Bright beams of moonlight entered through the opened up roof and basked the broken compartment in a serene glow, making the blood of the passengers sprawled on the half-eaten seats glow like melted rubies. Wind funneled in through the gigantic hole in the roof, rattling the broken pieces of metal that jutted out from their frames. How are we supposed to get past this bastard? Trisha asked, aghast at the sight in front of her. Feed it, I replied. At least, that's what it says in the diary. I don't think he needs our help to feed himself, she remarked. I think we need to keep its mouths busy and sneak past it. I suggested, a, a faint idea swirling and beginning to solidify in my brain. We gathered up broken bits of iron and human body parts that were scattered on the floor and prepared to push past this monstrous fleshy blob when a powerful roar boomed from behind us, announcing the presence of the man with the lion's head. Having already seen him before and having retained those memories, it was easier for me to get used to his overwhelming presence, but couldn't see the same for Trisha, who'd frozen in fear after locking eyes with him. Trisha, I shouted, then punched her in the shoulder to snap her out of it. It worked, and she began to move, despite the abject terror etched across her face. Crossing this carriage, with these two monsters surrounding us, was the hardest little stretch we had to cover. I've lost count of the number of times I've had visions of my death, only to change our movements and die yet again, and then repeat the whole process all over again. I had my head gobbled up by the tentacled mouths, was beaten to death by the lion, had my limbs torn from my body, with the end result being that my body began to ache even though I didn't actually suffer those injuries, a fucked up version of phantom limb pain that exploded in my body as my mind failed to process the information it was being overloaded with. But finally, there came a time where everything worked out perfectly well for us, all the pieces of food we tossed landed right next to the tentacles, and we scrambled past the cannibalistic monster with perfect timing, such that the tentacles swung into action the moment the man with the lion's head appeared in their range. Whirring and striking like demonic little snakes. As I stumbled out of the carriage, I heard the latter roar with anger and frustration as he began tearing apart the tentacles that hungrily wrapped around it. That lion-headed bastard was definitely going to win the fight, but it bought us enough time to get the fuck out of there. Unfortunately, my body was in no mood to listen to the commands my brain frantically fired at it, and just completely shut down. The exhaustion, the fear, the sensory overload had fried my nervous system, and sapped my muscles of all energy, such that my arms hung like limp noodles, devoid of any life. I fell down hard on my ass, my legs turning to jelly. Get up, man! Trish screamed, wrapping her arms around my waist. Get up! We're almost at the finish line! Move! She pulled me up, but my legs just couldn't support my weight, and thus both of us ended up wobbling and stumbling. Come on! She panted. You've done so well, honey. Just push. Move! She exerted all her strength and literally dragged me down the passageway, transporting us to our destination. Exhausted, out of breath, with sheer will pushing us forward, we had finally arrived at compartment number one.
Part 5 There were several things about compartment number one that made it different from anything we'd seen until now. Beginning with the door that was left ajar. The first one we'd encountered on our journey that was already open, and invitingly so at that. With a red carpet rolled out on the PVC floor like the tongue of some majestic primordial beast. The sound of cello softly wafted through the open door. A beautiful melody that I recognized very well. Whoever was playing Handel's Sarabende certainly knew their way around those bulky stringed instruments. Trisha and I stole a glance at each other and walked into the carriage. It felt like we'd walked into another world. It didn't look anything like what a passenger coach in this train should look like. The long padded seats and metal walls had been uprooted and tossed outside, only to be replaced by ornique, teak dining tables covered in embroidered white cloth with silver cutlery atop them. Ugh, it was as if this compartment had been converted into a restaurant. It would have made for a beautiful sight if not for some of the jarring oddities. First were the uh, customers in the restaurant, who were actually just the passengers travelling in this coach, if their warm yet decidedly middle-class clothes were anything to go by. Sitting on the tables with blank expressions on their faces, and black, tar-like tears running down their cheeks, didn't seem like they'd volunteered to be in this position. Second was the bear, napping in a far-off corner of the carriage. He was much smaller than the one we'd recognised earlier, but deep in my bones I knew that this beast was more dangerous, and it wasn't even close. The power radiating from this one was a physical thing that sat heavy in the air, making it thick and nigh unbreathable. But we didn't even pay much attention to him because of what he was sitting next to. Third, near the bear was a table so long it pretty much spanned the entire width of the train. Splayed out on top of the table was a corpse, with its intestines bulging out and hanging limply by its sides like blood-red sausages. The man with the head of a lion was sitting and eating the corpse's innards, stuffing them into his mouth like an ill-mannered child and shredding them to pieces with his sharp canines that were yellowing around the edges. Sitting next to him was a woman, young, maybe mid-twenties like us, sipping red wine and balefully glaring at the lion-headed monster. Surrounding them were four more of the passengers with thick black tears rolling down their faces, and their arms were moving with sudden jerking motions like fucked up little marionettes as they belted out the classical tune from the cellos resting against them. It was all so surreal that we just stood staring at the unbelievably strange sight in front of us. With our jaws dropped so low, they almost touched our chests. Fuck, is that him? Trisha whispered, her voice trembling like wind chimes in winter. I was about to nod when every head in the carriage swung in our direction, the movement sharp and abrupt like a gunshot. The cello stopped singing with a sharp shriek. Silver fork and knives ceased raking against empty plates, and even the bear silently snarled at us. The only one unperturbed by our appearance was the man with the lion's head who continued feeding on the corpse before him, but I don't think that was because he'd anticipated our arrival. No, it seemed to be because of our sheer irrelevance to him. Does a lion care about ants scurrying around on the ground near him? No. At least, not unless they sting sharp enough to draw his attention. Trisha quickly popped off a couple of shots at the lion-headed monster who snapped and caught the bullets between his teeth, before slowly chewing them and gulping the mangled lair down without sparing so much as a glance at the woman who just tried to kill him. Then his teary-eyed puppets attacked, jerking up out of their seats and charging us without a care for their oddly contorting bodies. I closed my eyes, blinking back tears of frustration. When will this nightmare end? Trisha roared and met the black-eyed freaks head-on, punching and kicking to her heart's content, like she had two compartments back. But things were different this time. This bunch with thick, tar-like tears streaming down their faces were much stronger than those people we'd thought through. Not to mention Trisha had been driven past the point of exhaustion, her wheezing and trembling body now moving by pure instinct. A couple of feeble punches connected, but they didn't even daze her attackers. And I'm not even talking about myself, My entire body was sore, and it took everything I had just to stand on my own two feet. 
so it wasn't at all surprising that I was subdued within seconds. What was surprising, however, was what happened next. The two of us were forced down on our knees, our arms twisted behind our backs at angles so sharp our bones were at the brink of snapping into pieces. I would have screamed if I'd had the strength to do so. My eyelids drooping, I was drifting off to sleep when I was jolted back to wakefulness with sharp cracks across the face. The vicious slap had left deep, red imprints of long fingers on my left cheek, but at least I was awake. The lion-headed monster stood up, and so did the lady with the wine glass beside him. Oof, deja vu, a horrible sinking feeling emerged from the pit of my stomach, as if a heavy anchor had been tied around my waist and then kicked into the ocean. Death would have been a welcome release from this hell, but it was not to be. As the demon got closer to us, with the carriage creaking and shifting under the weight of his footsteps, an explosive roar cut through the air from behind us and reverberated in the luxurious compartment. I gawped at the lion-headed monster who walked through the door and came face to face with the lion-headed monster standing in front of us. This strange sight made my head swoon. The one in front of us roared back at the intruding doppelganger, who instantly burst into flames sending fiery little sparks drifting in the air that singed the skin of the brainwashed passengers who didn't even flinch at the heat radiating from the burning monster. The demon snarled in anger before turning to look at the woman beside him. She put her hands up in defense and opened her mouth to calm the agitated monster. But he was in no mood to listen. He grabbed her by the throat, but then seemed to hesitate and finally proceeded to let her go after growling in frustration. Before I could even begin to contemplate on what was going on here, he disappeared with a loud pop, sending a powerful gust of wind that knocked us back, sending me crashing into a table, causing heavy silver cutlery to come crashing down on me. When I next came to, I saw the same strange woman leaning over me, her brow furrowed with concern. Are you okay? she asked as she helped me sit up straight. What happened? I croaked, my throat so parched it seemed like every word scraped against it. It's over, she said, smiling. You did it. Did what? My eyes lazily scanned my surroundings. We were still in the same compartment, but things were a lot different from when I was last conscious. The train had come to a halt, and every passenger here lay crumpled on the ground, out cold. I spotted Trisha sitting in a corner chugging down water. She winked when she saw me. What happened? Where's that lion monster? I mumbled. And where's the damn pet bear? The woman brought some water for me to drink before telling her story. She said that her name was Ritu, and that she was the one who'd summoned that monster. I tensed up when she said that, but she quickly moved on, arguing that it was a big mistake and that she'd been trying to send the bastard back to hell ever since. She talked about how her family was murdered and she wanted to get revenge against the killers, so she summoned him, but far from helping her, the demon broke out of her control and went on a rampage, killing innocent people and inflicting psychological torture on her. Seeing as she was the one who summoned him, she'd been bound to him and vice versa, and it wasn't until this train journey that she got the chance to get rid of him for good. So, you're like a witch or something? I asked, not believing the words coming out of my mouth. She nodded. I shook my head, surprised at my ability to digest that statement without a hint of doubt. A witch with magical powers. Oh, I couldn't even... Wait, I said, interrupting my own chain of thought. The visions that I've been having, was that because of you? Her eyes widened at that. You were the one who ended up getting the gift. Her head swiveled, took a look at Trisha before coming back to me. I actually wanted to give the power to her, not you. My powers, they um, sometimes misfire. Why? I asked. I mean, why give me or her that power? So that I could trap him, Ritu replied. The way that he designed the horrors in this train is that each compartment gets its own unique hell, and the passengers aren't allowed to get out of their carriages. So I added some modifications in his plan, subtle layers of additions just beneath his own magic, 
allowing you to move between coaches and giving you the power to see the future. But Trisha could move as well, I pointed out. I do not know why that is, she admitted. Maybe it's because she was with you. Maybe it's because she has her own unique circumstances that allow her to bypass restrictions placed by Purson. Purson? Yeah, the demon. Oh, so, um, what happened to him? He's caught in a time loop, trapped in there for eternity, she replied. He's always loved traveling through time. It's the first thing he reaches for every time he gets into trouble. I knew he would do that, so I took advantage of our connection and added another condition in his magic. That is, if he comes across himself, he would burn. Wow. And that worked? Yes. The more outlandish a restriction, the more powerful the magic. Like a spring reaction, she answered. So using you two as bait... I messed with his plan, which made him go to the past, bringing him face to face with himself here. When he saw himself burn, his reaction was to go back in time, hunt you down and fix things. And on and on we go. Oh, my head hurt as I tried to process this. He won't just break out of this time loop, will he? No, his gigantic ego will not let him think of any other way and the arrogance hammered into his brain over thousands of years of existence will not just go away like that. Of course, being caught in the loop ended his ability to influence anything, which is why everything should return to normal now, relatively speaking. So, what happens now? I asked. Now we wait, Trisha added. I looked at her, her beautiful eyes glinting under the moonlight that streamed in through the window. My people will be here soon to clean this freaking mess up. Your people? They hunt monsters like Pusan, Ritu replied. It's why I chose her to help me put him down. Ah, of course she does. But I need to leave, she added. I don't think they would take kindly to my presence, considering that I started all of this in the first place. Ah, they wouldn't, Trisha agreed. And I'd stop you if I wasn't falling apart. But why? You helped stop this, I protested. Innocent people wouldn't have died if it hadn't been for my blind first for revenge, she replied. I'll pay for my crimes eventually, but there's something I must do first. What? There's someone out there who still gives a shit about me. I'm going to find them and then turn myself in. Is that okay? She quickly glanced at Trisha, who shrugged. Do whatever you want. It's not like I can stop you, right? I was seeing Ritu off when I noticed something sticking out of her backpack. A brown leather diary. Ah, so that's what it was. Ritu, can you send physical objects back in time? She looked at me, eyebrow raised in confusion. Yes, but... I'd have to hurry. My powers are weakening as more time passes with Poisson still stuck in the loop. Good. I'm going to have to borrow that diary of yours. Something tells me I'm going to need its help. Didn't take me long to scribble on the first page of the empty diary. And why would it, considering I knew exactly what to write? Trisha's people arrived pretty quickly after Ritu had left. But in the meantime, I did finally go to the toilet and relieve myself feeling grateful for the opportunity to do so without demon bears trying to kill me. I then strolled out to find the other passengers slowly waking up, getting extremely disoriented as they found themselves in the strange compartment. Trisha's people had arrived, armed to the teeth with strange tattoos on their foreheads, the shape of a trident with a crescent where the hill should be. They proceeded to take control of the situation, guiding the passengers safely outside to get them fresh air, food, and water. I saw Trisha getting chewed out by someone who appeared to be leading this group of men. He stiffened and walked away when he saw me coming. Trisha turned and grinned when she saw me. Are you in trouble? I asked. A little. Lucky's just upset I wasn't as prepared as I should have been. But you didn't know this was going to happen. Oh, we always have to be prepared, Mayhem. It's kind of what the job's about. So you hunt monsters, huh? Well, that's pretty cool. It is, isn't it? 
I nodded. So, what happens to the passengers? Their memories will be wiped clean. This will appear on the newspapers as, um, well, a tragic accident. Will they do the same for me too? I asked, aghast. Not if I put in a good word for you. She winked. Will you? Depends. On what? On whether you buy me a coffee. Well, what an extremely weird and wonderful story that was. Did you enjoy that one? Kind of all over the place, but quite compelling in its own way, and, um, well, felt a bit like, uh, No End House on a train, didn't it, really? <laughs> Thoroughly enjoyed reading that one. And, of course, I'll be back again very, very soon. How are you all doing? Hanging in there? I'm trying to do some of these longer stories to keep you occupied while you're at home. Hope it's helping. Well, very tired after that one. Oof. But, of course, I'll be back again very soon either here or on my second channel. If you're not subbed to my second channel, here's a chance to do it. Shorter stories over there usually, but things to keep you going until I get back here with the next longer story. Well, till next time, very, very sweet dreams, and bye-bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams, and bye-bye.